So today I'd like to start with a story about my oldest brother, uh, Greg, uh, who is standing here in uh, this picture in front of me in this pretty awkward uh, family photo. <laughs> Greg, like me, grew up in a small farming town in Iowa, far from the ocean, but somehow I always knew that he was destined to spend his life on the water. My earliest memories of Greg are uh, of him playing with his tropical fish in the tanks that were lined up on the side of our dining room. My most exotic vacations were spent uh, visiting Greg on Sapelo Island uh, off the coast of Georgia, where he was studying to be a marine biologist. On one of the trips, Greg invited me to join him on his research boat to go uh, collect lobsters. After a long day of hauling traps, Greg and I uh, took the boat and stopped at the site of a shipwreck that was resting on the ocean floor in about 30 feet of water. As soon as the bo boat stopped, Greg immediately jumped off the boat, no mask, no fins, swam down through the water, through the dark water, to the shipwreck, entered into the open, uh, uh, open side of the ship and disappeared. I couldn't believe it. I tried to join him, but I could only get about 10 feet deep before I had to turn around because of the pressure. I waited a couple of long, nervous moments before Greg finally reemerged at the other end of this 70-foot boat and slowly ascended back to the light. As Greg joined me at the surface, his eyes lit up as he told me about what he had seen in the boat, the giant groupers and the orange roughies that, um, that he had seen. I could only imagine, but the impression really stuck with me. These many years later, I'm still wondering what's happening below the surface of the water. So, in fact, the oceans, which cover 70% of, of the planet's uh, surface, are on the verge of an economic boom, with industrial activity driving what may be the biggest economic opportunity of the century. At the same time, the ocean's life support systems are flashing red and are at risk of collapse. So today I'd like to explore the question, can we save the oceans and can the oceans save us? So life on Earth would literally not be possible without the ocean. It provides many services to us. For example, oxygen, massive waves of microscopic ph phytoplankton circulate in the oceans using photosynthesis to produce over half of the oxygen um, that's in our atmosphere. For one out of every two breaths that you take today, you can thank the ocean. For nearly half of the world's population, they uh, depend on the ocean for their primary source of protein and micronutrients. And over 80% of our planet's biodiversity uh, is actually below the water. And of course, we all love to spend time on the beach. I have a theory about this. I think the reason for that is because our brains and our hearts are also made up of about 70% water, just like our planet. What's often overlooked is the critical role that the oceans play in our global economy. Ocean-based industries like shipping, fishing, uh, energy, and tourism generate over $3 trillion of economic activity every year. And interestingly, they're growing at twice the rate of the rest of the terrestrial economy. And so today, we stand uh, at a, a really critical moment. I'd like to explore one question. Can, the oceans, uh, can we save the oceans, and can the oceans save us? So, as many of you know, the Earth's uh, warning signals about the ocean are flashing red. We can see this in uh, the wild uh, stocks of fish that are declining at exactly the moment that demand for seafood is exploding. Uh, the oceans also have a critical uh, impact uh, from climate change, which is rising, uh, raising ocean temperatures, uh, depleting oxygen, in making our oceans more uh, acidic. And so uh, these problems are not uh, separate, isolated problems. They're the early signs of a system failure. The ocean is sick. So we stand at this crossroads with these two conflicting trends. On one hand, 
We see the ocean as a compelling new frontier for economic growth. And on the other, ocean uh, ecosystems are at risk of collapse. We've seen this movie before. Land-based development did produce significant economic gains, but at great uh, uh, steep cost to the ecosystems, and usually at the expense of marginalized people. So the oceans can provide great uh, support to society and helping us to fight climate change. But we can't keep treating oceans as an endless store of resources to be exploited, or as a giant trash bin to absorb all of the waste that we've created on land. We need a new approach. Enter the blue economy. The World Bank defines the blue economy as the sustainable use of ocean resources for economic growth, improved livelihoods, and jobs while protecting the ocean's ecosystem. This term gained currency over the last decades, led especially by uh, coastal uh, uh, governments like Norway, Portugal, and Seychelles. Beyond governments, there's a rapidly growing network of businesses, nonprofits, and entrepreneurs that are also working at this intersection of ocean sustainability and business. As the blue economy evolves, we can identify four common features. First of all, these uh, innovative uh, solutions shift the emphasis from exploitation to restoration. They also increase resilience from the impacts of uh, human activity and climate change. Third, they move us toward more renewable resources. And fourth, they use data and analytics to better monitor and manage uh, the marine environments that we operate in. Let me take a closer look at a few of the specific examples of the blue economy that I'm most excited about. GreenWave is a nonprofit organization based in Connecticut that uses vertical ocean farming techniques to uh, create aquatic gardens that grow a mix of different kinds of seaweed as well as shellfish. Bren Smith, who's pictured here harvesting his seaweed, has worked over the last 20 years to create a unique model of ocean farming that uh, has some unique features. For example, uh, these systems have no inputs, no fertilizers, no chemical, no fresh, waters, uh, fresh water inputs. The other interesting thing is that these gardens produce a, a multiple types of raw materials that can go into products serving multiple industries. For example, seaweed can be used to produce everything from frozen foods to shampoos to yogurt to even pharmaceuticals. The third aspect is that these gardens have environmental co-benefits. So in addition to their economic benefits, they also help to absorb carbon and nitrogen and address climate change and filter water and make bays cleaner over time. So as we scale these ocean farming techniques, we don't have to make the choice between economy and environment. Another innovation that, uh, that increases our resilience comes from the world of insurance. So as storms are becoming more and more severe, coastal communities and businesses are increasingly finding it difficult to bounce back from the shocks. Working in the Mesoamerican Reef uh, in Mexico, uh, the Nature Conservancy and the insurance company Swiss Re have designed a unique insurance product for nature, uh, allowing for local communities to restore the reefs and to uh, build back their infrastructure in ways that allow them to, um, to be sustainable. So what happens is that because these businesses want to um, preserve their resources, they make a regular payment into this uh, resilience and insurance fund. And then when the major storms hit, the insurance company immediately pays out to these local businesses in order to allow them to actively restore the reef as well as repair the coastal uh, infrastructure and continue to attract tourists, which are critical to the local economy. So this system points out, I think, another interesting feature is we often think about physical infrastructure as what's key for addressing climate change, and that's true. But we also need to radically reimagine the social and economic and institutional tools like insurance to allow us to be resilient even as the um, storms increase. Another feature of the blue economy is a shift toward more renewable resources. Uh, offshore uh, wind energy, 
uh, is a really interesting opportunity in producing large quantities of carbon-free electricity uh, and can be serviced by tapping the consistent winds off most of the world's coasts. So the northern European countries got a head start on this over the last decade and have currently the largest amount of offshore wind. But there are major projects emerging in both the U.S. and China in the next several years that will significantly increase the total global supply of uh, renewable energy from offshore wind. So this industry by 2040 is likely to increase 15-fold and become a, a trillion-dollar industry. Another industry, another example, let's talk about shipping. Global ships, uh, these massive vessels that you see on the oceans, transport over 90% of the products that you and I use every day. But this industry has been relatively slow in reducing their emissions created by burning uh, dirty fossil fuels. However, in the last year, the International Maritime Organization has set ambitious new targets for the industry to reduce their carbon footprint 50% by 2050. What this means in practical terms is that every ship on the water will have to adopt a range of strategies from changing to cleaner fuels to uh, actually moving slower across the ocean and being more efficient uh, and even uh, employing new technologies like this high-tech sail that you see on the ship uh, in the picture. So, this is an uh, interesting opportunity for us to use the ocean in a way that can decarbonize our uh, electricity supply. And finally, there is an explosion of new innovations that are happening using data and intelligence to take on some of the biggest ocean conservation challenges. Here's a problem that you may not know. Uh, did you know that about 30% of the sea, uh, seafood that you buy in the grocery store actually may be mislabeled? This lack of transparency about what we're buying is a huge impact on the oceans. But these entrepreneurs from Conservation X Labs are developing a solution. They've developed a handheld, low-cost tool which allows th uh, them to scan the DNA of any plant or animal anywhere in the world. So this tool allows us to monitor what's being caught uh, in the ocean and what's being sold in the store. So uh, critical in increasing the transparency of our global supply chains. Another example, I recently met a team of entrepreneurs in Boston that are working on this uh, unmanned autonomous sailboat called a data moran. The data moran is equipped with um, sensors of various sorts that are tracking conditions on the ocean uh, in real time. As we build fleets of uh, monitors like this uh, system and many others, we're gradually being able to put together a more robust 3D view of what's happening on the ocean and allowing us to better coordinate the ocean's many users and uses. So I began by asking the question, can we save the oceans and can the ocean save us? I think the answer to that question is yes, real change is possible. But we're going to need to do some things differently. First of all, we're going to need lots more ocean champions, maybe like some of you, who will develop restorative, resilient, renewable, and smart solutions that we can bring to scale. And we're also going to need a new perspective. When you look at the map on, on the left, you can see that the, historically, this is the way we thought of the Earth we placed the continents with big, colorful countries at the center of our vision. In this picture, oceans are peripheral to what mattered. But as we make the transition, we need to think about the ocean in more like the way that astronauts have experienced when they've gone to space. When astronauts go to the space, they talk about a shift in their awareness, something called the overview effect. And what happens in the overview effect is, Instead of seeing life from the surface of the planet, looking down on this tiny blue marble, hanging in the void, wrapped in just a thin layer of atmosphere, it powerfully recasts our relationship to the planet. Like the astronauts uh, experienced, we need to go through a similar trans uh, transition. When you look at this actual satellite of the uh, Earth from space, what you see is our planet is mostly ocean. So as water-based creatures that live on a water-rich planet, 
we need to embrace the, uh, the idea that the fate of this gorgeous and fragile expanse of blue will determine our future. Thank you. Thank you.